The Duke Who Saved Me. Written by Edith Bird and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website. Save more purchasing our bundles. Enjoy. Prologue. The gentle swaying of the boat was captivating, the motion smooth but fast at the same time, and looking out over the rail only made it better. Nothing but blue water and blue sky to be seen for miles. At the end of this voyage, she looked forward to a world of new experiences, a world where she would never again need to be the prim and proper Miss Henrietta Robinson, where she could simply... That is the last I wish to speak of it, Dorothy. A sigh broke through as she was torn from her dream, from staring at the beautiful painting of the ocean voyage by her father's gruff voice. Ah, Dotty, in trouble yet again. Another sigh as she moved to the bedside table to ring for Elizabeth. This would require some tea. No sooner had the maid left the room than Dotty could be heard racing up the stairs. Their father would no doubt have had something to say about that if he had not been the one to send her scurrying away in the first place. For now he seemed inclined to ignore it, and instead it was Henrietta who was left to calm her oh-so-frantic sister. Oh, Hattie! There was no time to even prepare herself before Dotty threw herself into the room and into her arms. Hattie! He just does not understand! She practically wailed, and Henrietta tried to offer a sympathetic look. Dotty, you know well that father never understands us. I thought for sure. I thought he must realise I am not like those other girls. But is that so wrong, Hattie? Is it so bad not to be like them? Dorothy pleaded. Not at all, dear. It is not wrong. But father cannot see it. He cannot understand it. Henrietta gently brushed her sister's hair back, attempting to soothe her but Dorothy was in no mood for that. What shall I do? She paced back and forth across the room. What was the trouble this time? Henrietta asked. Oh, the servants were telling jokes in the kitchen, and I had joined in. Father was furious. He said, he said... She dissolved into sobs again, sinking into a chair, and at that moment Elizabeth returned with the tea tray. She seemed startled for a moment before regaining her composure and studiously ignoring Dorothy as she poured out a cup of tea for each sister. You may leave, Elizabeth. I can manage from here, Henrietta instructed distractedly. As you wish, miss. With a quick curtsy, her eyes downcast, Elizabeth left the room as quickly and quietly as she had entered it, closing the door softly behind her. No doubt she would go to whisper with the other servants about what was happening to Miss Henrietta and Miss Dorothy. Now, tell me what father said, Dotty. Henrietta insisted as she set a cup of tea before her sister. A sip of the hot liquid seemed to help her sister's resolve, and she managed to sit up straighter and not to sob quite so hard. He said that is likely why I am not yet married, and that, that I may end up a spinster because of my ways. She sobbed again. Oh, Hattie, what if he's right? What if he is? Henrietta retorted indignantly. What is the matter with being a spinster anyway? Why are we worth only what we can get through marriage? Oh, but Hattie, I do so want to be married, Dorothy wailed yet again. Why? Dotty, there's so much more out there, so much that we could do. She gestured toward the pictures on her walls. But with a husband, how will you ever do any of those things? I have never wanted these adventures as you do, Hattie. Dotty looked around the room at the array of treasures Henrietta had managed to gather. I want a home, a husband, a family. And what if all that is denied to me? What if I am not to have any of it? What if... She trailed off, hiccuping back even more sobs. Because you enjoy telling and listening to jokes, you shall never have those things? Ridiculous. Henrietta barely refrained from snorting at the thought. Father truly would be furious if he heard that. Father is being preposterous. You will find a husband, Dotty, if that is what you wish for. Oh, Hattie, I do hope so. 
It was now Dorothy's turn to stare deeply into the ocean-going scene. But Henrietta knew Dorothy saw something entirely different there than she did. But how dare father imply we are good for nothing else? That a daughter is only good for marrying off and bearing children? There is so much more to life than either of those things. But do you not want to get married one day? Dorothy asked, her voice almost dreamy as she thought of it. Never, Henrietta insisted, her mouth in a firm line. I will never marry, if only to spite father. He uses us as if we have no worth, as if our only value is who we can ensnare to strengthen his connections. And what we want is of no matter. He cares not at all about how we might feel about the match, only that it will benefit him. Well, that will not be the case for me. I shall refuse any suitor he puts in my path. With a sharp nod of her head, Henrietta resolved herself to that fate. But Hattie, what if he never brings a suitor for me? What if there is no one who wishes to marry me, even for the dowry father has set? Now Dorothy was frantic yet again, the hard-won calm vanishing quickly, considering this new thought. Her eyes were wide as she thought of what it could mean to be the only woman of her age not to even receive an offer of marriage. There, there, Dotty. There will be a man who wishes to marry you, she insisted, her spite fading slightly at her sister's plight. There will be several. Do not listen to father. He knows nothing of what a suitor would have in a wife. But I am getting too old for a suitor. If one were going to come, why have they not come yet? The poor girl was most upset, but really, was it so bad to not have a suitor? Twenty-four is not so old. Oh, Hattie, it is. Most of the women my age are already married, and many have their first babes already. And yet, I have not had even one serious suitor. There was the melancholy again, and Henrietta passed her sister one of the biscuits from the tea tray. At least eating it would give her something to do and, hopefully, calm her. You will, dear. You will have a suitor, and one who will love everything about you. One who will enjoy the fact you laugh at his jokes. Do you really think so? A small amount of hope dawned on Dorothy's face. Of course, the right suitor has not yet found you, Dotty. That is why you are still not wed. A smile lit Dorothy's face then. A small one, admittedly, but she clearly felt better and she scrubbed the tears from her eyes. Yes, a tall, strapping suitor who tells lots of jokes and loves to laugh, she filled in. The perfect man for you, Henrietta agreed. There is a perfect man for you as well, Hattie, Dorothy told her. But Henrietta pursed her lips and shook her head. No, I will not find a perfect suitor. I will not even look for one. And if father finds one, I shall send him away. She finished this with a wave of her hand as if banishing an imaginary suitor from her sight. You truly will never marry? Dorothy was incredulous at the thought. Never, was the stout reply. If marriage is all father thinks we are good for, then I will deny him that. It is the one thing I can do. But then what will you do? Live out the rest of your years as a spinster? The word came out in a whisper, as though it was a forbidden word and not to be spoken. What is the matter with that? Why, I could do whatever I wanted, Dotty. That is just it. I can do whatever I want once I'm too old to be considered fit for marriage. Travelling to the West Indies, sailing across the ocean, all my adventures. I could never do it. Leave everything behind to sail to another world, one filled with... danger. Dotty shivered. That is exactly what is so exciting about it. I cannot wait to see the world, to enjoy every bit of it. Her eyes were as dreamy as her sister's as she gazed over the ocean scene again, but she was seeing it for what it was. Yes, one day, one day she would be able to enjoy all those things for herself, with no man to tell her she could not. Chapter One what utter nonsense. Trade deals were meant to be for goods. Tea he could sell. Baubles and trinket suitors and fathers would buy for their wives, daughters or betrothed were perfect commodities. 
Even some of the foodstuffs produced there were popular with the people of London, all of whom wanted to impress their friends with their exotic tastes. But human cargo. What was he to do with human cargo? To sell the people from the West Indies? Who would have thought he would ever have to consider such a thing? Humans were not cargo. They were not goods to be sold. He shook his head in exasperation yet again. The idea had been broached once before, and he had thought he had turned it down firmly enough then. The men in his office attempting to sway his mind had clearly not believed him the last time. They were determined to convince him this was the way of the future, and he could make greater profits in this trade than in any other. That may well be true. In fact, judging from the numbers and charts they had presented to him, it was undeniable. He could acknowledge that. But he had refused yet again. He would not treat any person in such a way. And if he were to find human cargo on any of his trade ships, there would be far more than the men's jobs at stake. This time, he had made certain they fully understood that fact. Even still, the men had been insistent, and if all was based on the numbers, then it made sense. The numbers did not lie, and they said human cargo was a big commodity. He shivered in disgust at the very thought. But numbers were not all his business was based on. Morals should win out over larger profits. When it came to people, human beings, he ground his teeth. He would never allow greed to push him to cross that line. He was hopeful his point had been made this time around. He was thoroughly exhausted from having had to make it so many times. Your Grace, a young couple passing greeted him, and he nodded in their direction, while continuing to stride purposefully forward. He had no interest in stopping to chat with anyone on his way home, and chose to turn toward the park instead. Perhaps it would allow him to escape the busyness of the street, and the natural beauty might help to ease his mind. He did enjoy strolling through the park every so often, and it had been some time since he had last been there. The park was lovely enough, with all the lush greenery and the flowers and trees. There was even a lake in the middle, where he would sometimes stop to rest. It was a calm place, and there were fewer people. Those who were around did not seem inclined to talk or disturb one another, choosing instead to enjoy their strolls in silence. Two young ladies walked towards him, a maid trailing not far behind her head down. None of the women seemed to notice him, the maid because she kept her head bowed. The first of the ladies had her nose buried in a book, even as she walked. And the other one had a hand on what must be her sister's elbow, steering her to avoid any danger, but at the same time looking wildly around, as though she could not wait to be away on her own. Still, he gave a small nod towards them, and the impatient one gave a half dip in his direction, before the pair continued onward. They had long passed when he finally settled by the lake. Yes, this would be a good place to rest, to take a few moments for himself before returning home to the work waiting for him there. Finlay would be coming soon. Perhaps he could help calm his mind. The strain of his position was far too much at times, and Finlay was the only one who could ease the burden. Though no one could truly ease his burden. He stared out over the lake, his eye catching on a small gathering of ducks, floating easily down the still pond. If only things could be that easy for him. A simple life. The life he had lived before he became a duke. When he was only the heir and a young one at that. Yes. Things had been so much simpler then. In the days before he had to worry about trade routes and pirates attacking his ships, and of course the nonsense about human cargo. He shook his head to clear that thought. It was doing nothing to calm his mood after all, and he did not need to become even more angry. It shall be up to you now, Lawrence. Take care of your mother and the business. He could still hear the words his father had said before the sickness took him. Though taking care of his mother had turned out to be a fool's errand, as the sickness had taken her too, not long afterwards. But the business, that he had been forced to attend to every day since, with barely any assistance once his father was gone, 
And of course, the man had not had enough time before his demise to teach Lawrence everything he needed to know. It had not helped that he had been but a wayward boy upon his father's passing. Barely even a man. A child, more like. Still playing at childish things and ignoring the work of his father. The work that, even then, he had known he would have to do one day. That had ended abruptly with his father's death, when he had been forced to grow up quickly. Too quickly. But he did not allow the morose thoughts to pull him down for long. After all, those days were over. And it was long past time he moved on from the feelings of his lost childhood. There were business dealings to handle, contracts and negotiations to settle. And of course, matters at home to take care of. The responsibilities of a duke were never done. And what was that nonsense Finlay had mentioned the other day? A loud splash startled him from his thoughts, and he looked up in time to see a flash of blue skirts and dark hair slide under the water. Even that brief sighting was enough for him to recognise one of the two girls he had noticed when first entering the park. A glance about the area showed no sign of the other girl or the maid. In fact, it showed no one anywhere near her. But surely the water was not so deep in that spot. She would pop up at any moment, embarrassed and sopping wet but fine all the same. Yet she did not. He stood sharply watching the area where she had disappeared, but there was no movement. The ripples from her fall were starting to disappear as well, and he hurried around the lake to see what he could find. Nothing. No sign of her, and the current seemed stronger than he would have expected. The water was a little deeper as well, and he could not immediately see her underneath it. That was when he caught a glimpse of a shoe stuck in the rocks, and a small spot of blood on another. She must have gotten too close, caught her foot in the rocks, and lost her footing. But the blood concerned him most, and he looked closer into the water. There had to be a sign of her. But with no sign of movement and the water beginning to still, he jumped in, amazed at how clear the water seemed once he was under it. And there she was. She was still, entirely too still under the water. Even if she could not swim, which most young ladies could not, she should be floundering or splashing under the water, but she did not move a bit. Her body had settled at the bottom, and so he scooped her out and pulled her onto the shore. Leaning over her, he could tell she was not breathing. There was no movement in her chest, no feeling of air coming from her mouth or nose when he leaned forward. But what was it that he was meant to do? There had been something in the newspapers around London recently saying something could be done if a person were to stop breathing. He knew he must get air into her body in some way, but the instructive pamphlets had only recently been issued to the public, and he had only briefly glanced at one. Still, the girl lying entirely too still before him was unnerving, and he knew he had to try, whatever he could remember. So he settled himself beside her and pressed the base of his hand against her chest, pushing firmly and then leaning down to breathe into her mouth. Yes, that was it. But it did not do anything, and he remembered women tended to pull their stays a tad too tight for the sake of a slimmer figure, ridiculous though it was. It was possible she could not even feel the pressure he was applying. He felt no hesitation in rolling her onto her side and loosening the stays at the back of her dress so he could begin again. Still no response. But he did not stop. He would get her to breathe whatever it took. Hattie! A shrill scream nearly tore through his concentration, but he continued what he was doing. That must be the girl he had seen accompanying this one, though where she might have been until then, he could only imagine. Oh, miss! Another frantic cry came. Must be the maid, he deduced, likely terrified of what this might mean for her as well, since she was no doubt tasked with caring for and watching over both girls. And there was another group. A small crowd had begun gathering around himself and the girl as he continued trying to revive her. Luckily, they all seemed to realise it was best to leave him alone and to let him continue what he was doing, because no one came too close. Someone even appeared to be holding the other girl back, though her frantic and sometimes unintelligible cries and sobs were distracting. All he could do was pray this was going to work. 
Chapter 2 The pain was intense, and it was the first thing she recognised, a burning sensation in her throat that said she'd inhaled entirely too much water. And then the pressure at her chest registered, and finally a light pressure at her lips, which startled her so much her eyes shot open. She coughed frantically, her body jerking as she struggled to turn on her side and cough up the water still trapped in her lungs. There was a man beside her. She was aware of him, but all she could really focus on was the pain of the water in her lungs and the feeling she was entirely out of breath. It was as if she'd just run about the house the way she'd used to as a child. But she did not think she had been running anywhere. In fact, she could only remember a slow walk in the lake. There was a light rumbling noise, and she realised the man was talking to her. But she could barely make out his words. There was too much happening behind him. Too many other voices were muttering and speaking as well, and her head was still spinning from the water. My name is Lawrence Webbs. What is your name, miss? It took a moment after he had stopped speaking before she was able to comprehend the words and finally opened her mouth to try and speak. Henrietta. The words sounded as if it had been scraped from the inside of her throat, but he seemed to understand her. Dorothy and Elizabeth raced to her then, draping a shawl over her soaking clothes. Dorothy was frantically muttering and crying, while Elizabeth attempted to calm her and check on Henrietta at the same time. Oh, oh, miss! Miss! Are you all right? I am fine, Elizabeth. This kind gentleman here has seen to that. She managed to get that out and accepted his assistance when he helped her to stand. He was even patient while she attempted to get her legs to hold her weight and her head to stop spinning once she did. Oh, Hattie, are you really all right? You said you were going to take a stroll and when I looked up I could not see you any more. And then I saw this man jump into the water and then there was a crowd and... Oh! Dorothy clutched her closer, a frantic note to her voice. I am quite all right, Dotty just a little dizzy and cold. Where is your home? Lawrence finally stepped in, and Henrietta attempted to tell him, but Elizabeth jumped in quickly. Only a few blocks away, my lord. She directed them, while Dorothy kept an arm wrapped around Henrietta, who was shivering under the shawl. He stayed beside both girls as they all left the park, and she tried not to stare at him. He was also soaking wet, and he had put his lips on hers, and his hands on her chest. She flushed and kept her head down, but that did not stop her from hearing what was happening all around them. How convenient that young man happened to be going by at just the right time to save her. Indeed, and a girl slipping on a rock and getting knocked entirely unconscious. Who has heard of such a thing? If you ask me, the entire thing was quite inappropriate. She flushed a darker shade of red, and wrapped the shawl around herself, leaning towards her sister and away from the man who had insisted on walking them to their home. It only seemed to draw more suspicion and stares from people as they walked through the park. He did not speak to them again until they had arrived at the house. Oh, Henrietta, what has happened? The shrill cry brought everyone nearby running, including their father, who took in the appearance of his youngest daughter soaking wet, and the similarly attired stranger beside her with something that might have been concern. Perhaps he truly does care for me, Hattie thought wryly, though she wondered bitterly if that was just because he may have lost out on her worth in marriage if she had drowned. Henrietta, are you quite all right? What has happened, child? Oh, father, she fell into the lake and this gentleman managed to save her. Dorothy exclaimed with enough emotion to raise their father's eyebrows in surprise as he glanced between the two girls and over to Lawrence. Oh, my lord, I'm very sorry. I let her out of my sight for only a moment while Miss Dorothy was reading and... put in the maid. If I may. Her father interrupted the maid, who fell silent immediately, and led them all into the drawing room. Henrietta was directed to a chair, and Dotty chose to hover over her rather than finding her own. Lawrence declined to sit, citing his wet clothes. I was waiting in the park for a friend, and I heard a splash when your daughter fell in. 
When she did not resurface, I went in after her and was able to resuscitate her, using some of the new techniques that have been publicised recently. He summed things up quite easily and quickly, seeming to take great pains to make sure he did not appear to be a hero. You fell in the water, Henrietta, her father asked, glancing over at her with a tone and look she could not quite decipher. I was only trying to get a closer look. There were some fish I was looking at and my foot got stuck in the rocks. When I tried to pull it out, I fell and hit my head and that's all I remember. Her explanation sounded silly, but it was the truth. What kind of young lady tried to get a closer look at fish? And not only that, who could possibly get themselves knocked out in the process? Only her, of course, it was her awful luck. Lawrence Webbs, if I am not mistaken, the Duke of Ashbury, her father stated inquiringly. Elizabeth and Dorothy quickly curtsied low to the Duke, and Henrietta attempted to stand to do the same, but her father gave her a stern look, saying, Stay put. Of course she attributed her compliance to the dizziness in her head, rather than any wish to obey him. You are correct, Lord Suffolk, Lawrence acknowledged. Your Grace, I thank you greatly for saving my daughter and returning her to us. You must stay for tea, and we must think of some way to repay you. I must decline, as I do have a prior engagement, Lawrence replied, his voice formal. Are you certain? Yes, though I would like to return tomorrow, if I may. To check on Miss Henrietta? Lawrence glanced toward her, and she attempted to incline her head slightly in his direction. Of course. You are always most welcome in our home, Your Grace. Lawrence glanced over at Henrietta again, and she ducked her head to hide a sudden blush. You should have a doctor come around as soon as possible to assess her condition. She hit her head, and she has swallowed a great deal of water as well. We will, Your Grace. Another round of curtsies, and their father showed him to the door. Along the way he instructed the maid to summon the doctor though Henrietta did not realise it until she was woken up from her short nap a short while later. She had been covered with blankets to counteract the chill from her wet clothes, but she was still quite cold and a little bit damp. The doctor simply told them to get her warm and give her some hot soup and a tonic he had brought. It would help to restore her after her experience, and it seemed to work as the tonic calmed her and the warm broth Elizabeth brought up soothed her throat. The head wound he cleaned and proclaimed much less serious than it seemed at first glance, which led them all to rest easier. Once Henrietta had been bundled up in warm, dry clothes in her own room, Dorothy returned. Oh, Hattie, I was so scared. I couldn't see you, and then when I realised you were the one they were gathering around. Her voice had started to rise, as if she was getting worked up again, and Henrietta placed a hand over hers. I'm all right now, she soothed. Yes, thanks to a handsome young lord. Was he? I had not noticed, she replied blithely, but there was no fooling Dorothy. Of course you did. And he saved your life. Oh, it is so romantic. There was that dreamy voice again, and the eyes gazing off at nothing. Dotty, you and your silly novels. There is nothing romantic about it, and we shall never see him again anyway. He asked permission to call on you again, Dorothy teased. Of course, for propriety's sake. He pulled me from the water. He must at least pretend to take an interest. But Henrietta's voice was uninterested and unconcerned. Then, he will likely return tomorrow, if for no other reason than that. Henrietta just laughed and rested back on the bed. I think you are wrong, sister dear. Oh, but just think how romantic it would be. He saves your life and escorts you home, and then comes to call on you while you recover. Her voice trailed off as she became absorbed with her own fantasy. And then what, Dotty? Do you think he will profess his undying love, and we shall be married and live happily ever after? This is not one of your romances. Henrietta laughed again, but Dorothy's eyes had glazed over. It would be so wonderful if it was. You forget. I have no wish to marry anyone. And if I did, it would definitely not be a duke. Whatever would a duke want with a baron's daughter? But Dorothy would believe her own fantasies, 
and there was nothing Henrietta could say to convince her otherwise. Chapter 3 a nod from passing strangers was common, even in this area, where they did not know him as well. But there seemed to be more people on the street than he remembered, and all of them seemed to be staring in his direction. As he drew closer to the Suffolk Manor, the glances he received seemed even more pronounced, with many turning away to whisper as he passed. He could only catch a few words at a time as they did so, but the words he did catch were concerning. Lake and the Suffolk girl. Yes, something was definitely amiss, but what exactly, he could not tell. When he entered the Suffolk Manor the following day, it was clear something was happening. The servants were quiet and the rest of the house seemed to have an atmosphere of tension he did not recall being present the day before. His first thought was Miss Henrietta's welfare, but the servant assured him the young lady was feeling quite well that morning as he led him into the study to meet with the Baron. Ah, Your Grace, thank you for calling on us today. Baron Suffolk rose from his chair to greet Lawrence before gesturing to another chair nearby. I wanted to ensure Miss Henrietta is doing well, Lawrence replied, sinking into the chair indicated. Things seem to be worse than I feared, came the Baron's hesitant but concerned response. Worse? But the servant said your daughter, oh, not Henrietta, she is doing well. The Baron was quick to comment. I will call her down in a moment. But first there is something we must discuss. And what is that? Lawrence asked, intrigued. Rumours have started to spread about you and my daughter. Rumours? He sat back in his chair. Yes, he supposed that made sense considering what they had witnessed. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor, like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. They say that you and my daughter arranged your meeting yesterday in the park and the drowning was staged to allow for the inappropriate conduct which occurred between you. The Baron was hesitant as he spoke and Lawrence could only assume he was trying not to offend. That is preposterous. I had never met your daughter before yesterday, and to think I would stage such an event to take advantage of a young lady. He was furious. Was this what the rumours were about? That he had attempted such a thing with this young woman? I trust you entirely, Your Grace, and I trust my daughter. The Baron's voice was placating but still concerned. And why should he not be? It was his daughter's reputation at stake, her entire future. However, the rumours have begun already to spread across London, and I do not know what may arise as they continue. He threw his hands up in exasperation, and Lawrence knew something would need to be done. I will take immediate action and stop these rumours. I will not allow them to damage your daughter's reputation in any way. I trust you will try, Your Grace. However, all of London knows who you are and is most interested in your life. This incident will make you and Henrietta the object of their gossip. And with so little known of you as it is, they are even more interested in the supposed impropriety. The Baron was right, of course, but that did not mean Lawrence was going to just sit back and let idle gossip about him hurt a young lady. I will do everything I can to quell the rumours and to ensure Miss Henrietta does not suffer from them, Lawrence insisted. There have already been some consequences. Again, the Baron seemed hesitant to speak further. What could have happened in such a short time? Lawrence rose from his seat to pace toward the window. One suitor has already withdrawn an offer of marriage to Henrietta. It is likely, as these rumours continue, others will follow. He wondered briefly if the Baron was exaggerating the extent of the damage caused by the rumours to push his daughter onto him, but he seemed an honourable man. And hadn't he just heard some of the murmurings and caught the stares himself? In fact, even now he could see people gathering outside, gossiping to one another. There must be more I can do. I can order it stopped. You could, Your Grace, but that would only cause more trouble. 
The more you attempt to hush the rumours, the more others will continue to spread them. They will think the reason you seek to quiet them is because they are true. Lawrence could see the truth in that as well, and yet there was nothing else to be done. He would have to quiet the rumours, or else... Perhaps there is something that could be done to boost her dowry to attract other suitors, he suggested. Your Grace, I have two daughters. The dowry offered for her is what I can afford, the Baron replied gently. Perhaps I could assist you in that effort. No, Your Grace. I thank you, but I believe that would only cause more questions. Even if the origin of the extra dowry remained unknown, many people would wonder at an increase so soon after the rumours. Lawrence knew that was true as well, but he was trying to avoid the only other possibility he knew of, taking Henrietta as his own wife. It was high time he was married, but he had no need of a wife and knew nothing of this lady save for her name. She was a pretty thing, what he could remember of her, but was she right for him as a bride? Could he be content with her by his side? The other suitors she'd known, they at least knew something of her but he knew absolutely nothing. If you do not mind, I will take my leave and return soon to check on your daughter. The Baron immediately rose and shook his hand, showing him out of the door. But it was no better outside. He could clearly tell things were not going to quieten down. He and Henrietta were the talk of the town, and it was highly unlikely he would be able to do anything to stop the rumours now. In only a single day, it seemed as if most of London had found out about the event. And while there were some who expressed sympathy for Henrietta, or seemed impressed by his having saved her, there were far more who believed the whole incident had been staged. They believed the pair had arranged it merely to allow for the scandalous events which had followed to occur. As if he would have planned such a thing with any young lady, let alone one he did not even know and to be found out engaging in that sort of inappropriate behaviour in a public place was even worse. How could any of them think he would do such a thing? There was not much time left to him if he hoped to make things right, if he hoped to change the tone of rumours and save the girl's reputation. Whether he would like to have her as his wife or not, there was no longer any way to prevent it. The only way to save her reputation was to take her as his own bride. If he did not, have you heard? The Duke and a Baron's daughter. I have heard they have been meeting in secret for months. Can you imagine the nerve of it, in a public place? At the park, no less. Yes, there was nothing else to be done about it now. He had not made it far from the Suffolk Manor, but he turned back anyway, brushing past the servant who sought to lead him back toward the study. Baron Suffolk. Ah. Yes, Your Grace? The man turned, startled, from where he was standing before the bookshelf. It was clear he had not been expecting the Duke back quite so soon. I realise I have... complicated things for your daughter. You have saved my daughter's life, Your Grace. That I will never forget, the Baron amended. True, but it has... damaged her prospects. Her father could not refute the fact and simply nodded his head. I wish to marry your daughter, my lord. That startled the baron. Whatever he had been expecting Lawrence to say, it had not been that. Marry my daughter. But your grace. The baron sputtered in his surprise as he moved back to his seat and sank into it. It is the only way to save her reputation. And it will improve mine as well, Lawrence replied, standing stiffly before the desk. It, it would be an honour, Your Grace, for my daughter to marry a duke, but for you, it would mean marrying beneath your station. The man seemed genuinely concerned about his daughter, and his actions did not strike Lawrence as a ploy to get her an illustrious husband. He seemed much too startled by the offer, which went some way to reassuring Lawrence he was not being tricked. It is I who have damaged her prospects, no matter the reason and I will make things right by you and your daughter. If she will have me, I will gladly take her as my wife. The Baron seemed to have no idea what to say, attempting to catch his breath at the prospect of marrying his younger daughter to a duke. 
I, I shall send for her right away, Your Grace. If you are certain... He paused another moment before reaching for the bell on his desk. I am, Lawrence stated firmly. He was not, but it truly was the only way, and so he allowed the Baron to ring for a servant, and the butler immediately appeared at the door. My lord, the butler asked from the doorway. Fetch my daughter, Henrietta. Yes, my lord. The butler bowed to them both and left the room. I am very grateful to you, Your Grace. This will allow Henrietta to have a far better life than we could have imagined for her, and it will prevent the rumours from hurting Dorothy as well. Lawrence had almost forgotten about the older sister, but yes, marrying off the sister who had rumours surrounding her would definitely aid the elder girl as well. He would be helping to save both girls from a life tainted by unsavoury rumours and potential spinsterhood. The thought helped him feel a little better about his decision though he was still not certain quite what it would mean for him. Still, the idea of getting married was entirely new to him. It was something he had not even considered previously. There was always work and so much else to be done. It had never seemed very important. He had always assumed when he did marry, it would be something that would advance his business, or if he were lucky, to a young lady he cared for and who would be helpful in his future. And now... To marry a young lady he did not know at all. That was definitely not what he had expected. He was a duke, but that did not mean she would necessarily accept him, even if she had no other prospects. It was possible she had a suitor she cared for, whom she was hoping would stay, or she may not even know of the rumours surrounding them both just yet. He was surprised at how nervous he felt as he waited for her to arrive. It was almost as if this was a traditional proposal and he was waiting for a woman he loved. But he hardly knew Henrietta, so why did he feel so nervous? Chapter 4 Miss Henrietta, your father requests your presence in his study. Of course, Frederick, thank you. He bowed and she took another sip of her tea to steel herself for whatever was about to happen. Father did not request her presence for just anything. It must be something important. What do you think it is, Hattie? Clearly Dorothy thought there was something to it as well, but she simply shrugged it off. I do not know, Dotty. Perhaps he wishes to inquire about my health. She tried to sound flippant about it, as if she were not concerned, even though she most certainly was. The last time Father had called her to his study was to scold her for venturing out without Elizabeth, but she had so wanted to take a walk, and the servants had all been busy. She shook her head to clear it. This was no time to be thinking about the past. She needed to be focused, so she could be ready for whatever it was Father wanted. But she could not think of anything she might have done wrong. And usually, Mother was here to help calm him whenever he got into a sour mood. However, she had gone out to visit relatives that morning. Perhaps the Duke did come back. Dorothy's voice broke through her distraction. Why ever would he have come back? To check on you, of course. She shook her head but walked out of the door, her sister on her arm. Whatever was happening, at least they would face it together. That would be better than trying to go about it alone. So, the two girls walked arm in arm into the study to greet their father. Only he was not the only one there. Both dropped into a quick curtsy for the Duke, who nodded his head to each of them in turn, remaining standing by a chair at the back of the room. It did not seem that he was going to speak just yet, so they turned their attention instead to their father. You sent for me, father? I did, Henrietta. But Dorothy, you may go. Yes, father, Dorothy began, starting to pull her arm away. I would rather she stayed. Henrietta insisted quickly, glancing from her father to the Duke somewhat nervously, though she tried to hide it. He seemed uncomfortable, though he was smiling in her direction, which made her even more nervous. If he was so anxious about whatever this matter was, then it had to be bad. This is really not something that Dorothy needs to be part of. I would feel more comfortable having her here, she insisted and though Dorothy hesitated, she held firm to her arm. If she prefers her sister to stay, that is all right. The Duke spoke up again. 
and she inclined her head in his direction as a thank you. Her father seemed unhappy but finally relented. Very well. Henrietta, the Duke and I have been discussing the current situation regarding your future. My future, father. She did not like the sound of that at all. Indeed, after your traumatic experience in the park, it seems there have been some... rumours circulating about you. There are some who would believe... well, awful things about yourself and the Duke. She could only imagine what the rumours might be, and she found herself furious at the thought. Nothing inappropriate happened between us. I nearly drowned and the Duke saved my life, was her only response, her mouth a firm line as she stood tall. She could not even look at the man behind her, afraid that if she did, she would blush like a schoolgirl instead of the young woman she was. Indeed. And there are none in this room who dispute that, my dear. It was somewhat reassuring he believed her, but she knew that could not be all of it, or her father would not have called her here. He did not bring her to his study to gossip about rumours which had no bearing, which meant something else was going on. The Duke and I have been discussing what this means for you, and it has become clear that your prospects have been damaged by this incident. My prospects? She knew what he meant, but tried to hedge around it. For marriage, Henrietta? Yes, that was what she had feared. But if her father was so worried about her marriage prospects... I have said I do not wish to marry, father. If this means I shall not have to, then so be it. Her voice was firm again, as if the decision had already been made. But of course, it would not be that easy. Do not be silly, child. You will, of course, be married, her father scolded, and she once again felt the urge to bow her head like a child. But this has made it more difficult to find a suitor. One offer has already been withdrawn, and I suspect others will be as well. Offer? There has been an offer made for my hand, and you have not even told me of it. She was furious now. How could her father have entertained an offer without even telling her? Would he have promised her to someone without her even knowing who it was, let alone having a say? There have been several, but they need not concern you. His response was flippant, as though it was of no consequence at all, but she could not let the matter drop. Not concern me. They were offers for me, for men to claim my hand, to claim me. And yet you saw no reason to discuss them with me. It is no matter now, child. He always called her that when he wanted to make it appear she was being unreasonable. But she did not feel as though she was being unreasonable. If he was going to promise her to someone without her consent, should she not at least have knowledge of the fact? She opened her mouth to argue, and Dorothy's hand on her arm tightened, trying to calm her. This was neither the time nor the place. Dealing with whatever these rumours were and with the Duke standing in the corner of the room meant her father would not wish to seem less than strong. Arguing would only embarrass him, which would make the entire situation worse still. One gentleman has revoked his offer. The others are likely to do so after this incident, and you may well not receive another because of it, he continued, ignoring her. Then I shall be a spinster, she retorted firmly. Insolent child. Do you not see that becoming a spinster, especially considering these rumours, would reflect poorly on your family, on your sister? She balked at that, glancing at Dorothy, who only looked at the ground. I do not wish to burden my sister with something she does not wish for, father, Dorothy put in softly. If Henrietta does not wish to marry... Be silent, he snapped. And Dorothy fell quiet immediately, still looking at the floor but her hand now trembled on Henrietta's arm. That was the only thing which could have made her consider an alternative to not marrying, the only thing that would make her do anything, and he knew it. He knew she would do whatever she must for Dorothy's sake. My being a spinster has nothing to do with Dotty. It should not reflect on her. But her voice was less firm now, and she struggled to maintain a strong expression. And yet it would as would the rumours surrounding this situation. You have no other prospects, 
and without a marriage, your sister may well have few prospects of her own. At least his voice sounded somewhat gentler now, as if he knew that was not what she would want, or as though he was about to say something she would like even less. Everything was spinning out of control. But there was something else, too. Something she did not yet know. She could tell. There was something the two men were not telling her. And when her father looked toward the back of the room, the pieces suddenly fell into place. The Duke and I have discussed it, and it is settled. You shall become his wife. Wife to the Duke. She was barely able to get the words out of her mouth, her own hand tightening on her sister's. No, thank you. I thank you for saving my life, Your Grace. But marriage, to marry you because of... I couldn't. She struggled again to get the words out, and Dorothy squeezed her arm again. Hattie, hush. The voice was quiet in her ear, so only her father could have heard it but he ignored her outburst. It was enough to make Henrietta shut her mouth and look between the two men. It could not be true. It could not be the only course for her, to marry someone, someone she did not know. But if the rumours would hurt Dorothy, her dear Dotty, who wanted marriage and a husband and children, could she take that from her sister? We have discussed it, Henrietta. It is the only course of action. There was that firm voice again, as though she had no say at all in the matter, and likely she did not. He had already been planning to promise her to another man with no notice. And now this one has just fallen into his lap, she thought grimly. You and I shall be wed quickly, and any rumours of impropriety will disappear soon thereafter. It will become of no consequence to those in London or elsewhere once we are wed. The Duke finally spoke venturing forward with that strange look on his face. He behaves as though he is better than me, she decided. That was the look she saw on his face, as if he were doing her some sort of favour. Though perhaps he was. Saving her reputation, marrying beneath himself to protect her and her sister. But that did not mean she would let him speak to her in that way. Your Grace, I understand what you are proposing to do is a great honour though not one that she wanted. Yet it is not necessary. There will be someone, if I must wed, there will be someone who will make an offer. She attempted to sound confident, but the words would not come, and she struggled along. And what if they do not, Henrietta? Her father spoke up. The Duke has made an offer for your hand, and for the sake of yourself and your family, for your sister, you must seriously consider it. It is in all our interests that you accept. You will be a duchess, Henrietta, and you will be able to put all this unpleasantness behind you, behind us all. The wedding will be performed with haste, but it will be an affair worthy of a new duchess. I will not deny you the wedding you deserve, the Duke chimed in. There was that tone again, as if he was doing her some type of favour by granting her a beautiful wedding while at the same time killing every one of her other dreams. A grand affair would not be to my taste, Your Grace, she retorted, but it did not seem to faze him one bit, and though her father gave her a sharp look, he did not say anything. Once we are wed, you will come to live with me, and all will be well. I will assist your sister also in finding a match. It was the only thing that caused her to feel even the smallest amount of interest in his offer, though the rest set her teeth on edge and made her pull her shoulders back. The two were talking about her future, as though everything was settled, as though she was a child who did not know what she was about. This will be an excellent opportunity for you, Henrietta, and it is the only way to stop what has already begun. Once again she heard the gentler tone in her father's voice. He knew she was unhappy, and was trying to keep her from another outburst. We will ensure there is no further hint of impropriety, and there will be nothing to imply any damage to your honour. We will deny the rumours at every turn. It seems you have already discussed everything. Has my father already discussed the dowry he offers for me? It is not much for one of your position, Your Grace. 
The sharpness of her tone was not lost on any of them, and Dorothy gripped her arm fiercely and hissed another sharp rebuke in her ear. I have no interest in your dowry, miss, and it is no concern of mine what it may be, the Duke replied, his voice stiff and somewhat haughty, as though he would care about the paltry amount her father had promised for her hand. At least it must seem paltry to a Duke. The Duke is doing you a great honour, her father insisted. His teeth gritted as he ground out the words. Yes, I understand the honour. To marry a lowly baron's daughter when you have prospects so much higher, your grace. She knew she was taunting him, and that it was inappropriate but could not help herself. It seemed the only control she had at that moment, as everything else had been taken from her. Henrietta, that is quite enough. Will you accept the offer? Her father's sharp voice was tempered only by the fact he was trying to put on appearances for the sake of the Duke. I thought that had already been done for me. It appears my future has already been determined, even when we shall wed and how. Henrietta. There was that warning voice. Hattie. Dorothy's voice was sharp in her ear. She finally set her shoulders back with a cold look at the man who was ruining everything. The man who had saved her life and destroyed it with a single act. Yesterday she had been grateful to him for saving her. Today she wondered briefly if drowning would not have been a better prospect. It would be my honour to marry you, Your Grace, she finally managed to get out, and he gave a slightly deeper bow that time. She responded with a curtsy as best she could, at any rate, since she refused to let go of Dorothy. Dorothy was, perhaps, the only reason Henrietta was still standing firmly in place before her father's desk. If her sister hadn't been there, she might have run out long ago, despite her resolution to not appear a weak-minded girl. The honour is mine, the Duke responded, causing her to grit her teeth and glance back toward her father, unsure if she was now dismissed. There was an awkward pause before he spoke again. Are you feeling quite well, Miss Henrietta? I am, Your Grace, she replied, though her voice sounded cold even to her. I have you to thank for that. He simply inclined his head and fell silent again. So, perhaps she was not the only one to find this entire situation awkward and uncomfortable. I will arrange things with the church. The preparations will be made, and the ceremony will be in two weeks' time. Very well, if I may be excused. The two men nodded, and she half dragged her sister out of the room. In fact, she was so anxious to get away, she barely managed to close the door softly and not race up the stairs to her own room, though it was unlikely her father would have said anything if she had. He was likely very pleased with the turn of events, though not so pleased by the behaviour of his daughter. If only their mother were here. Perhaps she could have done something, anything, before all this had been decided. But she was away, and there was no one to speak for Henrietta. No one to sway her father's decision with that gentle way their mother had. Oh, Hattie, a duke. You're marrying a duke. At least Dorothy sounded happy with the idea. So it would seem. Now she was out of the room, she no longer needed to put on appearances. She needed time. Time to say goodbye to everything that mattered to her. Everything that had now been stolen from her. Are you not happy? You will be wed and so quickly. You will be done with all the things most women must do and at only nineteen, with trying to find a suitor and... I should like to be alone, Dotty, if you do not mind. Her sister's enthusiasm was too much after what had just been done to her. Do... are you sure? There was concern in Dorothy's voice, but Hattie did not have the strength to reassure her. Yes, I need to be alone. Dorothy seemed hesitant but finally left closing the door behind her. I will be down the hall if you should need me. Henrietta managed a slight nod, and then Dottie was gone. All Henrietta could do was look around the room, all the treasures she had collected, all the years of dreaming, hoping and planning for the day when she would finally be able to travel the world. When she would be free of all this nonsense about marriage and having a family. As she picked up each of the treasured items, she felt she was losing a part of herself. It was over. The dream was now officially over. She had nothing. She would never have any of it. 
she would be married, become the Duchess of Ashbury. For any other girl, it would have been a dream come true. But for her, it was the end of it all. How could she be happy when marrying this man meant giving up everything she had ever wanted? She sank onto her bed, consumed with grief over losing the life she had hoped to build for herself. Yes. It was all at an end now, and she struggled not to cry as she thought about it. What would she do now? She was about to live Dorothy's dream, not her own. But it would help her sister to get what she wanted. And that was the most important thing. The only thing she had left. I will do this. For Dorothy. She mumbled to herself, but the image of the sea, so soothing to her only yesterday, now seemed to taunt her as a dream she would never experience. Chapter 5 Henrietta wanted nothing to do with planning a wedding, and so it had fallen mainly to Lawrence. In fact, he had not even seen her since the day she had agreed to marry him. Everything that had to be done was done by him or her father. Her sister had occasionally made her preferences known, trying to make sure the rather small affair, as Henrietta had made it clear she did not want an elaborate event, was still as beautiful as possible. The sky on the day of the wedding was clear, which should have been a good sign, but Lawrence was not sure anyone was really thinking of it that way. For himself, he was just glad to be able to get to and from the church without having to worry about umbrellas and such. Your Grace? He glanced towards the door at the young lady standing there. It's me, Dorothy, Your Grace. Yes, of course. Henrietta's sister, I have received your notes making suggestions about the ceremony. She gave a small smile but still appeared nervous. Your Grace, I know you are doing a great thing for my sister, and that we should be very honoured, but she is very important to me. Please, please take care of her. The girl sounded more than a little concerned, but he had every intention of taking care of the woman who would be his wife. I will definitely take care of your sister, Miss Dorothy, he replied, receiving another small smile from the girl, but it was clear she was still nervous. You will always be welcome in our home. Please, feel free to come and see your sister whenever you like. You are too kind, Your Grace. But she seemed happy about the invitation, hurrying off to finish getting ready. Perhaps he had helped to ease her mind and make her sister happier as well. This was it. His wedding day. He had not thought it would ever happen. But then... Nothing these last few months had gone as he had expected, and to marry a young lady he hardly knew. Yes, this was going to be a very interesting day, and later, having a wife, being a husband, those were going to be things he would have to get used to. Only Finlay knew what was really happening. He knew everything that had happened. Though Finlay had been more than a little surprised by the turn the situation had taken, and the abruptness of the marriage. Even his uncle only knew parts of the story, though he may have pieced together more than Lawrence thought. He had done his best to make the day special for Henrietta. After all, it was her wedding, and he did not want her to regret it. The church was a grand one, though they would not have many people in attendance. Still, there were flowers, and he had offered to pay for her to have a wedding gown made if she desired one, and today he wore his best suit. Your Grace, we are ready to begin whenever you are. This was it then. After this he would be a married man, and his thoughts would have to include his wife. Henrietta. Hey, why are you looking so miserable? Sure, she may be a stranger, but she is pretty, and her sister seems all right. He managed a small smile for Finlay, but turned back to make sure his cravat was straight. I'm sure everything will be fine, he replied his tone sounding rather tense even to himself. I know this is not what you had pictured for your future, Finley stated, but it is not what she had pictured either. Maybe you could try not to be such a morose husband. I know, I know she deserves better than this, and I feel terrible for having forced her into this situation, he admitted, glancing back to Finley. 
You did not. The rest of London did. You saved her life. Ever the Joker, Finley could be practical when he needed to be. But that should not mean she owes me the rest of it. True, he acknowledged. But there is nothing to be done about that now. So, let us go and get you married. That was the truth of it, and he might as well get on with it. So, with a sigh, he turned away from the mirror and straightened his jacket. You are right, of course. With that, he allowed Finley to lead him into the chapel, past the empty pews, and to the front, where her parents and his uncle sat on either side. He stood before the pastor and waited, though he did not have to wait long. Dorothy came in first, in a pretty but simple dress, with a few flowers in her hands. Henrietta followed. She was beautiful. In fact, he had never got such a good look at her, and had not even realised how beautiful she truly was. Her hair had been done up and decorated with flowers for the occasion. The dress she wore was simple as well, which made sense, considering the short time available to get it made, but it fit her well. She seemed to be struggling to summon a smile as she walked towards him. This was one of the strangest moments of his life, standing across from a woman who would not even look at him, as they went through making the traditional vows of marriage to each other. He recited his own somewhat woodenly, his body tense as he stared at her but she studiously refused to look in his direction. Her gaze was fixed on the wall above the altar, though what she was looking at he had no idea. When it was her turn to say her vows, she hesitated for only a moment, her gaze flickering almost to his eyes before it snapped away. But then she began to speak. The stern resolve in her voice was not as firm as it had been last time he had spoken with her. She seemed less sure of herself, and far more uncomfortable. But she managed to get through the prepared words, and they were pronounced man and wife. You may kiss your bride, said the pastor. Now she met Lawrence's gaze with a startled look, which she quickly covered with a blank expression. The pastor was waiting, and so Lawrence leaned forward to gently and carefully take her into his arms. She was stiff, Obviously so, but he pressed his mouth to hers in a quick but gentle kiss before quickly releasing her and turning towards their small audience. At least her parents and his uncle looked happy enough. Finley, however, looked uncertain, and Dorothy looked as if she wanted to pull her sister away from the whole situation. And in fact, he was not sure which of the sisters moved first. Whether it was Dorothy reaching for Henrietta or Henrietta pulling away from him, but suddenly the sisters were holding each other, and Dorothy was rushing her sister out through the side door of the church. Well, Lawrence, she seems a lovely enough girl, though perhaps a little too attached to her sister. You may need to curtail that, his uncle told him. They are sisters and close. I work often. It may be good for her to have Dorothy with her for company, he countered. The last thing he wanted to do was take away Henrietta's one support when he was already taking so much of her life from her. Indeed, but sisters tend to put ideas into each other's minds, and who knows what you may end up with then, his uncle added. Lawrence inclined his head in acknowledgement. That might well be true, but it was still likely what was best for Henrietta. I wish you luck. Marriage will be good for you, his uncle finished. Lawrence nodded his thanks and shook the man's hand. Thank you, Uncle. I would stay, but I have business to attend to. I did not want to miss this day. Your father and mother would be proud of you. I'm glad you could attend, Uncle. Once the man had gone, he turned toward Finley. This is it. You are an old married man now, and before me. Who would have thought it? Lawrence managed a small smile, then turned toward the Baron and his wife. Shall we go to the wedding breakfast? My servants have put together something to celebrate the occasion. They agreed, following him out of the room, and a servant was sent to bring the girls. It was agreed he and Henrietta would travel together, and Finlay would travel with the Robinsons. It likely would have been less awkward if they had ridden in any other configuration, as Henrietta would not even look at him throughout the entire journey. 
Instead, she sat as close to the side of the carriage as she could and stared out the doorway. She did, however, permit him to help her in and out of the carriage. Once everyone had entered the main dining hall, the servants began bringing out plate after plate of delicious dishes. It was a magnificent feast, especially for a small party of only six people. But few of them could eat anything. It seemed only Finley and Dorothy were unaffected by the tension in the room, or at least they seemed determined to ignore it, as Finley continued telling stories and jokes, even as he shoved his face full of all the food he could reach. Henrietta kept her head down and picked at the few things her sister had put on her plate. Her parents seemed a little uncomfortable, eating small amounts of everything but not saying a word. And he... Well, he had no idea what was expected of him at this point, and tried to think of something to say as he forced down bites of what was usually one of his favourite dishes. Finley made another joke, and Dorothy laughed aloud before she covered her mouth with a napkin and looked down quickly. Your sister-in-law is quite the charming creature, Finley told him, nudging Lawrence in the side. Lawrence looked up sharply. Certainly this was not appropriate. Finley teasing and joking like that, and Dorothy giggling like a schoolgirl. I have never met a true Scotsman before, she giggled back shyly, and Lawrence looked to the Baron and his wife. He was certain this obvious display of flirtation would not bode well, but neither seemed offended by it. Rather, they seemed to be pleased with it, sharing a small smile before returning to their own meals, though perhaps with a little more interest now. Well, miss, I would be more than happy to meet you again. Dorothy giggled again, and Lawrence chanced to look at Henrietta, but she was still staring at her plate, studiously ignoring them all and what was happening around them. She seemed entirely oblivious to it, and he found himself wondering if he should say something to her. If you all do not mind, I am quite tired and would like to rest. Henrietta spoke suddenly, rising from her chair. He stood and gestured for one of the servants. Charlotte, if you would show the lady to her room? The maid gave a low curtsy and approached them. Just this way, Your Grace. They both started slightly at the term, but it was accurate enough. She was a duchess now, and the title was hers. As Charlotte led her from the room, Henrietta said a quick goodbye to her family and hurried off. In fact, she seemed almost skittish of her own parents and sister, and she studiously ignored him, not even glancing in his direction, and gave barely a nod toward Finley. He had received a short missive delivered by her sister, stating that Henrietta would like to have her own rooms, and he had readily agreed to the request. It would be far less awkward to be sharing a home with a stranger than attempting to share his bed with one, even if she was his wife. The servants had been informed before the ceremony that this would be the case, and rooms had already been prepared for her. In fact, she would have her own wing of the house to do with as she pleased. He hoped, at least, she might come to be somewhat happy here. It would, after all, not be pleasant to have a completely unhappy wife in his home, though he supposed they could learn to coexist well enough. The rest of the breakfast passed quite quickly, and the Baron and Baroness seemed to relax somewhat once Henrietta had left. Dorothy and Finlay were flirting shamelessly back and forth, stopping just shy of being completely inappropriate. In fact, they seemed to have forgotten anyone else was even in the room. They were carrying on together as if they were completely alone. As for himself, he found himself stunned by the overall situation. The Baron and his wife were exchanging glances and smiles, and Dorothy and Finley were behaving practically like children. And then there was him, sitting there silently. Dorothy, it is time for us to go, her mother Finley said, and it seemed both Finley and Dorothy were unhappy about it. But the girl stood and gave a low curtsy to both him and Finley, before breaking slightly with decorum to give Lawrence a hug. Brother dear, do take care of my sister. She may not seem so now, but she is a gentle soul. He was startled by the familiarity of the hug and the address, but the love she had for her sister was clear, and though her parents seemed appalled at her gesture, he gave her a half-hearted embrace in return and a nod. 
I will take care of her. You need not worry about that. She gave him a gentle smile then and allowed herself to be led away by her stunned parents who took their leave with the more traditional bows and curtsies. If you do not mind, Laurie, I will walk them to their carriage. Finley did not wait for a response, taking Dorothy's arm and leading her out of the house. It was finally quiet. None of the giggling and flirting. None of the half-hearted, awkward talking. Nothing that would make him think any of it had ever happened, except for the gold band on his finger. But the silence did not feel comfortable as it always had before. Instead, it felt deafening. He was not peacefully alone any longer. Whether Henrietta wanted to be a part of his life or not, she was there, in the house. And that would change things whether she made her presence known or not. He was almost grateful when Finley came back in and broke through that silence. She is the most delightful creature. I have only just met her, but I think I am half in love already, Finley remarked, with a slightly exaggerated show of putting his hands over his heart. Lawrence could not help but laugh and shake his head. I mean it, Laurie. The girl is an absolute delight. She loves jokes and that laugh of hers. It just makes me crazy. At least that is one of us happy, Laurie thought to himself, as he glanced down the hall toward where Henrietta was likely resting in her own rooms. At least one of them was pleased with their lot in life, and perhaps even in love. Henrietta? She was frightened for a moment, wondering why he would come here to her chambers. Surely he meant them to stay in their own rooms. She had requested it quite clearly. Still, she braced herself and opened the door. It was indeed Lawrence on the other side, but he took a step back as she opened the door and looked quite uncomfortable at being there. I did not get a chance to speak with you earlier. These rooms, this wing of the house shall be your own, to do with what you please. You will have all the servants you should need, and there is a carriage for you, should you like to go anywhere. Thank you. She managed to get that out grateful he had only come to discuss practical matters. He expected nothing from her. You may come and go as you please and feel free to invite any of your friends. I do want you to feel at home here, Henrietta. Thank you, Your Grace. You need not call me that. It is just Lawrence. They were married, but the name sounded entirely too familiar. Still, she gave a brief nod and waited to see if there was anything else. You shall have anything you want here. You may buy anything you choose and have it billed to the house. He hesitated a moment and made to go before turning back. I am sorry for the way things have turned out. He did not wait for a response, but simply strode quickly down the hallway and she closed the door behind him. Yes, she was sorry for the way things had turned out as well, sorry for this abrupt change in her life, the loss of all her dreams. But perhaps he was not so terrible, her husband. He was granting her freedom to come and go as she pleased, all the money she could ever want to spend on whatever she fancied, servants at her beck and call, rooms of her own to decorate as she chose. It was more than she could have hoped for. And yet, it was still not what she had hoped for in life. She wasn't sure what to expect the following morning, but when she rang the bell, a servant quickly arrived at her room, ready to assist her in preparing for the day. I am sorry I did not catch your name, she said to the girl apologetically. I am Charlotte, your grace. The girl replied with a deep curtsy, and Henrietta had to still the jolt which still came every time someone called her that. Please call me Henrietta, was her protest, hoping perhaps they could dispense with the formalities. Oh, but I couldn't, your grace. The girl looked shocked at the very thought, and Henrietta sighed. There must be something else you can call me. My lady? was the tentative response. Yes, yes, that will be fine. It was much better than your grace, at least, though still quite different from Miss Henrietta, as she was used to being called at home. The girl seemed more at ease now, assisting her with her morning routine, though it took a little bit of effort on both their parts, since neither was used to it yet. Where is the... She hesitated a moment. Where is... 
Lawrence. This morning. The two familiar names sounded awkward on her lips, and she was not sure she would ever feel comfortable saying it. His grace has already left for the office, my lady. He instructed us that you are to be given anything you request, and that the carriage is made available should you wish to make any calls. Yes, I should like to call on a few friends this morning, after breakfast. Of course, my lady. I will have Andrew prepare the carriage. Thank you, Charlotte. Would you like me to show you to the dining room? Thank you. It was going to take some time to get used to this expansive house, the sheer number of rooms she had passed. While reaching her own chambers had seemed daunting, and she would be expected to manage this household. The thought gave her even more of a fright. How could she ever run this household? Did he expect it of her? It was what a wife should do, and yet... She shook her head. He had said nothing of the sort, and with such a large household he probably already had someone to manage things for him. He would not want her to do that. The cook was willing to prepare anything she wanted, and after a rather filling breakfast, she made her way outside. Andrew, or so she assumed, was already waiting with the carriage and seemed more than happy to take her wherever she might want to go. Spending the day with her friends was only marginally better than being home in that large house alone. After all, all they wanted to talk about was her new husband and the fact she had got married to a duke of all things. Some had even heard the rumours about the incident in the park beforehand, that much she guessed, but would not speak of them, at least not to her. Henrietta, how did you catch the eye of a duke? Margaret was no doubt fishing for an invite to the house, perhaps to a party of some type, where she could meet her own rich suitor. In fact, she often talked of little else, and Henrietta had forgotten how much of a bore she could be. He saw me somewhere and wrote to father, she replied. They had decided it was not worth trying to explain he had saved her life in the park. Instead, they had agreed to keep the story as simple as possible. Perhaps I should go out more frequently. In the park, did you say? She had not, which meant Margaret had in fact heard the rumours but was too proper to say so. In town, she replied instead, ignoring the comment in favour of staying away from her new home a while longer. She could only visit with her friends for so long during the day, however, and when several of them proved to be out there was little else she could do. Instead, she left cards for each of them and determined to return the next day, or the next, until there was someone she could sit and speak with. It would keep her from Ashbury, from her new husband. They pulled up in the carriage at the same time as Lawrence was arriving, and he immediately came to her carriage to assist her out. It was clear he was as uncomfortable as she, however good breeding won out, as he escorted her up the stairs to the door. Have you returned for supper, Your Grace? She managed to get out, hoping he was not, but trying to be polite anyway. No, I must return to the office. I have a client in an hour. All she could do was nod her head, now at a loss as to what to say. Have you been calling on some friends, my lady? His response, after an awkward pause, was just as stiff. I have. I hope your visits were pleasant. They were. At that, he had led her into the house and released her arm with a bow, which she answered with a brief curtsy. Cook will prepare your dinner. I shall likely be late. Very well. Good day, my lady. Your Grace. With a moment of hesitation, he turned and strode off to his study, and she hurried away to her own rooms. It was awful to be in the same room with him. Not that he was ever rude to her, but it would have almost been better if he were. Perhaps she would not feel so awkward around him if he were merely rude or ignored her. He was making such an effort to be polite, but they had nothing to say to one another. It made things so much harder. The man could be far worse, she continued to tell herself. Indeed, many were married to worse. Yet... This sort of stilted conversation and sense of discomfort whenever they happened upon each other was certainly not what she might have wished for in a marriage if she ever were to have wed. Each day brought more of the same, 
Each morning, Charlotte would inform her that Lawrence had gone to the office early, and each day he would arrive home late. She would spend the entire day calling on friends to avoid the large, empty house, and the chance that Lawrence might come home during the day, though he rarely did so. It was a surprise, therefore, when she ventured out of her room later than usual to find him still at home. Your Grace, I thought you had left for the day. I had a business appointment that was cancelled, he replied. There was silence for a moment, while they both thought of something else to say. Will you go out today? I will. She hesitated a moment and continued. I must have new dresses prepared. The ones I have are inappropriate for... She could not bring herself to say the word marriage even now. For now. Order anything you like. It will go on my account. A nod was all she could manage in thanks. James will get you some walking around money. For any little things you may wish to buy. That at least was better than putting everything on his account, though she did not know if he ever dealt with his finances himself. Likely whoever managed the household would handle all the expenses too, and he would not know if she spent hundreds on her own whims. Though, of course, she would not do that. I thank you, Your Grace. He gave a bow and glanced over her shoulder. I must take my leave, my lady. She managed a half curtsy, and the moment was over. He was gone, and she was left to go about her day. Andrew was once again ready to leave as soon as she was, and this time she directed him towards the town. The dresses she had were not appropriate for a married woman, and the styles were wrong too. It would not do to continue wearing her old dresses if she were to go anywhere other than calling on friends. Ah, Lady Ashbury, I did wonder when I might be seeing you. She managed a small smile for the modiste who rushed off to fetch some fabrics from the back room. These are silks imported all the way from the East Indies, Your Grace. She ran a hand lightly over the beautiful colours. Yes, they were lovely and the fabric was very soft, but she couldn't think why she might need a dress made from it. It would be much too fine for every day. It is lovely stuff, to be sure. They have just come in, from your husband's ships, of course. Her hand stilled a moment over the bolts of material before she finally managed a smile. I see. Perhaps one, then. This blue, do you think? It will be beautiful, Your Grace. There was that title again, but it would be inappropriate to tell the shopkeepers and everyone in London not to call her that. She would simply have to get used to it. And until she did, she would have to smile and pretend she was fine. I'm most in need of new day dresses. For that, we have some lovely fabrics just over here. The shop was filled with many fine materials, and she was somewhat overwhelmed by having the ability to buy whatever she liked. Surely Lawrence had some idea what a full new wardrobe for a duchess might cost, but he had not told her any set amount she might spend. He was a duke, after all which meant there must be enough to buy the things she needed. She was concerned for a moment as to whether he would approve of the amount, but decided it was an expense she would not need to repeat for some time. It would be perfectly all right to spend a little more on a full wardrobe just this once, surely. And so she let herself be swept away by the fun of choosing her new dresses. It was, after all, the first time she had been able to do so without concern for the cost. The shopkeeper was friendly, and the fabrics were beautiful, and before she knew it, she had a full new wardrobe being prepared. The cost was high, but not so high as she had thought once all was done, and she returned to the carriage with a light in her eyes and more of a spring to her step than before. When she arrived home, it was to find Dorothy already there, waiting for her in the drawing room. Charlotte showed her in, and she noticed the unusual brightness and excited air of her sister. Dotty, Oh, it is lovely to see you. How are you? Oh, wonderful. So wonderful. What is it? What has happened? But Dorothy refused to say, and no matter how much she tried, she could not get her to speak of it. And you? How are you? Oh, I am well. I... My lady, another visitor has arrived. James showed the man in, 
and Henrietta smiled at Finlay. She did not know him well, but he seemed a friendly sort, and he and Lawrence were quite close. Oh, Mr. McLaughlin, are you here for my husband? No, my lady, I am here to see you both, actually. There was a sparkle in his eye which struck her as strange, and she wondered what he might be about. I see. She glanced over at him suspiciously, but gestured toward the butler. Go and see if the Duke has returned, will you? Of course, Your Grace. All she could do was sit and wait for Lawrence, as the other two did not seem inclined to speak, but only looked about them and not at each other with joy and excitement on their faces. In fact, Mr. McLaughlin could not even remain seated, perching on the edge of a chair and then jumping up to walk about the room. Finley, would you not rather speak in my study? Lawrence asked, striding into the room in confusion. No, this matter concerns us all. Sit, Laurie. Lawrence also looked suspicious but took a seat near Henrietta, watching as Finlay moved toward Dorothy to stand at her shoulder. We are to be married. Married? Henrietta echoed, looking between the two. Finlay set a hand on Dorothy's shoulder and she stared up at him with an adoring look. In two weeks, Finlay will be leaving on a business trip in just a few days and as soon as he returns we will be wed. Her sister was clearly excited, but Henrietta was worried, for Dorothy, being the elder sister, was prone to flights of fancy. Are you sure, Dorothy? You barely know him. Out of the corner of her eye she could see Lawrence shift uncomfortably, but he said nothing, and she chose to ignore him. I have loved Dotty from the moment I saw her, Finley proclaimed. Henrietta turned her startled gaze on him. No one had ever called her sister Dotty but her. But it seemed Dorothy was thrilled with it. In fact, the two looked very much in love, and she felt her resolve weaken. Perhaps Dorothy was prone to those flights of fancy, but she was also clever. And Finley seemed a nice enough gentleman. If the two were happy, who was she to make a fuss? I see. I wish you both happiness. In two weeks, Dotty. That's not long to arrange everything, she added with a mock scolding tone. It made Dorothy laugh, and even Henrietta managed a slight smile. Finlay, it seems congratulations are in order, Lawrence managed, standing stiffly. However, I'm afraid we will have to celebrate another time, as I have business to attend to. Come on, Laurie. Surely it can wait, Finley wheedled, trying to convince him to stay with them. I am sorry, but it cannot. He strode out of the room quickly, and Finley gave the ladies an apologetic smile. If you would excuse me, ladies, Finley hurried out of the room after him, though not without touching Dorothy's hand one more time, and Henrietta turned back to Dorothy. Oh, I am sorry if I have made things awkward for the two of you, Dorothy told her, a slight frown marring her face. Do not worry about me and Lawrence, Henrietta replied flippantly. I am so glad for you, dear. Is he everything you have wanted in a husband? He is perfect, Hattie. And just as you said, he loves the fact I laugh at his jokes and he loves to laugh ever so much. She was swept up in her sister's happiness, and the two settled together on the settee just as they used to do when they were young, clutching hands and talking excitedly about the upcoming wedding. I am so glad you are happy, Dotty. And Henrietta was. At least one of them should be happy in their marriage. And Dorothy was the one who had always wanted it. For Henrietta, for her sister to have everything she had always dreamed of was enough. And you? Oh, tis nothing. We manage well enough. She brushed it off before turning her sister's mind back to her own wedding. There was nothing really to say about herself and Lawrence anyway. They managed, though separately. He was polite and kind and she had everything she could ever wish for in this house. What more could she have expected? Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos.
Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.